very happy to have you here with me today. And I'd just like to give a big shout out to my new contacts on LinkedIn. You're all very welcome. The idea here, everybody, is to help you with your business English, to improve on your business English and also everyday English because we can combine the two. And what I'm going to bring you today, let's jump into it, is I'm going to be talking about how to respond to how are you. Now, we mentioned this in the last stream, and I'd just like to do a little test here. And if you, if I get the answer right, I want you to give me a thumbs up, okay? I want you to give me a like here on LinkedIn or on YouTube. And my question is, if I say to you, or if someone says to you, how are you? How do you reply? Okay, so say it in your mind. How are you? Okay, if you said fine, give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up in LinkedIn or give me a thumbs up on YouTube because we're going to look at this today and that's going to be an alternative and a couple of alternatives that you can use instead of saying this fine and you. Two thumbs up if you could say and you afterwards, because it's not something we do um, generally as native speakers. It's not so common to say right. there are alternatives and we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some LinkedIn news with vocabulary, pronunciation, synonyms, definitions. After that, we'll look at our phrasal verb, which will be touch base. We're going to look at a lot of examples so you can internalize it. And I'm going to explain how just by one phrasal verb at a time, how you can master phrasal verbs, okay? We'll do it nice and slowly because I understand they are annoyingly complicated. Okay, word of the day, we're going to do a business word of the day, which will be synergy. We're going to look at an alternative video. I was talking to some students today about a random topic and it was about death. So death is taboo in a lot of places or a bit sad to talk about, honestly. But we're going to look at celebrating death and a specific place where they celebrate death. So we're going to look at video and take some uh, listening from their pronunciation if necessary. After that, idiom of the day, cost an arm and a leg. And then we're going to focus on a on an interview question at the end, which will be about your salary expectations. So, like I said in the beginning, welcome to everyone who is new, uh, connected to me. You're very welcome. Just bringing you some business English uh, here with Elika for Mathion. And I am going to jump across first and we are going to look at ways to respond to how are you. Remember, if you said fine and you give me a thumbs up because I guessed it. Here are a couple of different, a few different ways that we can just reply to this. And I'm going to add an extra thing. So I'm doing well, thank you. How about yourself? Normally when we throw a question back, we say, how about you? But I'm giving you this new one that's very native, which is how about yourself? And even when you say, and you, even if you just say, and yourself, it just sounds more close, more warm. It sounds more caring. So we're going to practice with this. I'm doing well. Uh, thanks. How about yourself? The next one. Uh, I'm good. Thanks for asking. How are... Uh, and no, I should put here, how about yourself? Because I'm just doing it the same for everything, okay? How yourself, yourself. <laughs> How about yourself? I'm good. Thanks for asking. Or even you can just say, I'm good, thanks. Let's get rid of this. We're going to make it as simple as possible so you can, in fact, use these. I'm good, thanks. How about yourself? Not too bad, thanks. How about yourself? As I mentioned in the last stream, in the UK, definitely not too bad thanks or not bad thanks is the standard response, okay? Everybody is using this in the UK and Ireland. We are using this. Not too bad thanks, not bad thanks. How about yourself? It's not negative at all. It is the standard. Yeah, I'm good. Not too bad thanks. No negativity at all. And then finally, we have pretty good thanks. How about yourself? 
Use one of these today. Use the how about yourself. And even when we're talking about uh, an opinion, we're talking about somebody asks you a question and you want to then say to someone else, uh, because what most students will say, if Mark is here, they'll say, and you, Mark? But we'll say, how about you, Mark? What do you think? How about you? Even how about you means what do you think when we have a meeting and that kind of thing. So if you're in a meeting or you're giving an opinion or I answer to you first and you ask me, I'll often just reply, how about you? So well, what do you think of death? As we mentioned before, oh, I think it's a very, mm, I don't know, I don't like talking about it. Well, how about you? So it's how we ask about your opinion. OK, I'm not going to say and you. I'll say, how about you? So how about yourself for rep responding? Use it today. Remember, if you said if you say fine all the time, give me a thumbs up because we're not using that as often as you think. It's what they teach you in your books. You've probably been using it all your life. You have a fantastic level of English. We're not saying fine as much as you think. OK, we're going to move on from that. And, um, oh, just a, a, a point on that. What I was teaching some of my students this, and um, one of them even uh, caught me off guard. I wasn't ready for it. And she said, how about yourself? And it just sounded so native. I was uh, so happy to hear. It was so, it creates a closeness. So uh, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Not too bad, thanks. Any of those, how about yourself? Give it a go, try um, if you've been using the same reply for years and years and years, let's change and use something new for a while. Our phrasal verb is touch base. As usual, phrasal verbs don't make sense. OK, they're annoying. Why do we even have them? They're so annoying. They're difficult to use. Well, we love them in English. OK, we love them. And I'm sorry about that. So. This is a business one, and I'm going to try and visually explain it to you, okay? Because, um, let me see. Okay, so touch base is a phrasal verb, and it comes from baseball. And as you can see in this picture here, I'll just double check. Yes, you can see that picture here. This is the baseball pitch or field, okay? And this is home base down here at the front bottom of the screen. I'll just make sure you can see it. Make me double. Yes, OK. So we're the man in the black, the umpire in the black T-shirt. This is the base. And then over around, you have other bases. So what we call this home base. And the idea is you need to get around and touch home base. Touch base with your foot or touch it with your hand. OK, so that's all I'm going to say. That is base. And this expression comes from touch base. And it means to get in contact, to meet, to talk. You're touching base with somebody. So I'm going to give you some examples. And it's used in the business world to uh, get in contact with people. Let's have a look at a load of examples. You don't need to read them. I'm going to read them. You can listen. But if you want, you'll see them on your screen. They're a bit small, but because I'm going to give you 10 examples. So here we go. Number one, let's touch base next week to go over the project status. That could be let's talk next week or let's meet next week. But it's we say, let's touch base. Let's get in contact. So it's a kind of cool businessy expression to say, let's meet, let's talk. Let's touch base next week to go over the project status. Number two, I need to touch base with my manager before I can make a decision. I need to talk to her. I need to call her. I need to meet her. I need to see her. OK, I need to touch base with my manager. Can we touch base before the meeting to make sure we're on the same page? Can we meet? Can we talk? Can we see each other? Can we touch base? Can we have contact? I'll touch base with the vendor and get back to you with the details. This is a great little expression here is get back to you. I'll let you know. I'll get back to you. So often people ask you a question 
and you need to you don't have the answer right away and you'll say let me get back to you at the end of the day okay i need to touch base with my manager first and then i'll get back to you at the end of the day number five we need to touch base with the client to confirm their requirements we need to talk to the client we need to we need to see it we need to meet them we need to we need to have contact with them number six I just wanted to touch base with you and see how everything is going. This is perfect for a manager, for example. You're working from home or you're a manager working from home and you need to touch base with the individual members of your team. So you need to get in contact with them. How do you get in contact? Phone, video conference, whatever it is. You need to meet each other. Touch base. Very common there. I just wanted to touch. Hey, James, I just wanted to touch base with you to see how you're doing. Yeah, everything's fine. Okay, great. I'll touch base with you again next week. Seven, let's touch base after the conference to discuss any new developments. Discuss in some languages means argue like a fight. No, in English, it's just talking. Okay, we're just talking. We're discussing uh, on a specific matter. Let's touch base after the conference to discuss any new developments. Number eight, then I'm going to touch base with HR to make sure we're following the correct procedures. So I'm going to talk to them because I need to make sure I'm going to touch. I'm going to talk to them first. Number nine, can you touch base with the sales team and find out their projections for the next quarter? Can you get in contact? Can you touch base with the sales team? And finally, we'll touch base at the end of the day to review progress and plan for tomorrow. So this is generally used in a business context to touch base, not so much outside with your family or your friends. It's more colleagues, suppliers, clients, vendors, different departments, managers, bosses, CEO, whoever. Not so much outside, but it is moving across a little bit into uh, social life as well. Um, so before you wouldn't say to your friends, let's touch base. But now, now people are starting to use it. Somebody told me yesterday, she heard it on a program. So uh, English is very fluid. It's not so strict. I'll say one thing and this month, this month it's true. And next month it's changed. So uh, there you go. Touch base. Who will you touch base with later today? Are you going to touch base with your manager? Are you going to touch base with a client? And remember, <coughs> excuse me, touch base. The only word that changes in a phrasal verb is touch. In this case, it's the first word that will change. So when we talk about yesterday, Touch, it's like the normal verb, touch. I touch. Touch the table, right? So yesterday, I touched. So in the past tense, it's touched base. I touched base with my manager uh, yesterday. You touched base with your manager. We all touched base. So in the past tense, it's a regular verb it's a to touch is not it's the only one that will change so if you have an irregular verb like drive let me give you an example here to drive a car i'm not going to put two okay drive d-r-i-v-e drive so drive is not regular because in the past it doesn't have ed Okay, it's not, it's not drived, I drived. It's drove. Okay, let's get a, let's get a um, phrasal verb. Drive. Uh, mm, crazy. C, R, A, Z, or Z, Y. Drive crazy. Okay, it's make somebody crazy by, I don't know, working in the office, somebody speaking really loud on the phone. They're driving you crazy, okay? So, um, 
here in the middle, generally, the only one where it's because it's normally someone. So let's say drive me crazy, okay? But the, the phrasal verb is crazy, but we'll put me. It could be you. So I was in the office yesterday and Mark was talking on the phone really loud and I couldn't concentrate. He drove me crazy. I'm only changing the first word and I'm just, it's behaving like a normal verb. So just the first part behaves and after that, nothing changes, okay? So uh, if something's a routine, it's the present tense, I drive to work every day, okay, Mark talks on the phone and he drives, he drives me crazy, okay? That's how the verbs behave, just the first word we're going to change and I'm not going to complicate it anymore. Our verb for today was touch base. And you're, uh, well, I would like you guys today to try and touch base with someone or say, okay, then let's touch base later on uh, next week or let's touch base later. No specific day. Let's touch base. It's a good idea. Okay, I'm going to move across now. I hope that helps. And I'm just trying to break phrasal verbs down and keep them super simple because I know they're annoying. So I just, instead of giving you many, many phrasal verbs, we'll just look at one at a time, okay, to get the idea. Right, so we're going to look at some vocabulary here from some news. Elon Musk, always in the news, especially in business. Artificial intelligence. Intelligence. Well, let's let's have a look here. Pause AI to avoid risks to society. Industry experts say. Vocabulary here. Pause means stop for a while. Okay, when you're playing a song on uh, on your phone, when you want to stop it for a second, you pause it to pause. Executives are calling for a six-month pause in developing artificial intelligence systems more powerful than OpenAI's recently launched GPT-4. An open letter signed by a thousand AI experts, including Elon Musk, cites risks to society. Europol warned on Monday of chatbot use in disinformation and cybercrime. Okay, so uh, this is something that I, uh, is very useful now. It's the new chat GPT. You can use it. Uh, it's like a new style of Google. Uh, and it uses artificial intelligence to generate responses. So it's very useful, but it's so powerful. And you can create, you can ask all types of questions. You can, uh, may, many of you know, many of you don't. But it's a very useful tool uh, to use in your work. But let's look at uh, some vocabulary here. Six month pause, developing artificial systems, GPT-4, an open letter. This is public, by, published to the public that people can see. Uh, risks to society. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't think we have any more uh, vocabulary there. Let's just focus on the pronunciation and come down to pause. Energy European gas reduction target extended another year. The EU will continue a voluntary gas consumption reduction target of 15% until March of next year. The target was first introduced last August to combat the energy crisis. Uh, was extended due to economic and energy uncertainty per Euronews. That means... Big, um, Euronews gave the, uh, according to Euronews, Europeans reduced gas, uh, mm -hmm. Europeans reduced gas usage by 19.3% this winter. Remember, numbers point, 19.3%. European gas reduction target extended another year. When we see here the EU, we will not say the European Union, we say the letters, the EU. Reduction of 15% March next the target, which is your goal, your target in business. What are your targets for this year? What are your goals? First introduced last August. Uh-huh. Extended. Okay, let's move on. Work life. 
Why networking can be a game changer for your career. Game changer is a new buzzword for the last few years and uh, often you can use this in business life. Uh, comes from business uh, really to, you can say it in your general English and it's when it just, the normal way of doing things changes. So chat GPT is definitely a game changer because up until now we have been using um, search engines like Google or Yahoo to get information. Now we can use artificial intelligence to type in what we want and it will give us a response. ChatGPT and GPT-4 and BARD are game changers. It is important for job seekers to network, says recruiter Anne Paris. She highlights that it can be open, it can open up new opportunities that may not be advertised, allow you to connect with industry professionals and build relationships. Paris adds that networking can be particularly useful for getting noticed when moving industries. Well, this would be a perfect example here on LinkedIn where I'm streaming to. Um, people in the business area are networking and I do believe that sometimes your third uh, degree contact can be more important sometimes than your first contact on LinkedIn. So a game changer for your career. Absolutely. I think uh, the um, LinkedIn is a game changer because now uh, people can come and find you. They can look at your resume or your CV online. They can see what you're doing. And when you're looking, absolutely agree on this. Traditionally, you would send CVs. Uh, perhaps for vocabulary we have here in the second line below she highlights this is means to put a focus on um moving on idea of the day take a different perspective to unlock new ideas if you've ever if you've ever hold on if ah if you're ever if you're ever feeling stuck on a task Try thinking about it from someone else's point of view, someone else's perspective. In order to help you unlock new ideas, suggests Helen Tupper. Creating psychological distance reduces the emotion that can cloud our clarity. Think how a friend or colleague would approach your squiggly career conundrum. <laughs> okay, let's break this down into little bits. Take a different point of view or different way of looking to unlock it. If you're ever feeling stuck on a task, this means if you're, if you're not able to manage a task or you, you don't know how to progress, try thinking about it from someone else's perspective, point of view, in order to help you unlock new ideas. Creating cycle, and uh, I wanted to, there was a word that I wanted to look at. Okay, creating psychological distance reduces the emotion that can cloud our clarity. Cloud your clarity. Clarity is seeing things clearly and cloud is like when you're blurry, when you have your camera here on, uh, or you know when you're doing a video conference and you put the background as not so clear. This is blurry, but this is essentially what clouding is. Think how a friend or colleague would approach your squiggly. Squiggly is like, uh, this is a straight line, so this would be easy. Squiggly is like this. Career conundrum. Conundrum is a problem. But I saw something here uh, that I wanted to focus on. Uh, in order to. I was telling a student that we don't use in order to so much in modern, or not modern, in general conversation. Uh, we'll say, so watch. Try thinking about it from someone else's perspective to help you unlock. A lot of people feel they need to say in order to, but instead of saying in order to all the time, reduce it uh, a lot because we only use it really for explaining something. But if it's like, I can't go, uh, da -da -da, in, in, I have to do something in order to, it's not, it's not really explaining much to me. It's not, it's not a difficult thing to understand. But um, here, um, yeah, so what I would say, instead of saying in order to, uh, you just don't need to say in order, you just need to go to, 
get to the point as quick as possible. Okay, you can say it if you want, of course. It's correct. Today's debate is WhatsApp too invasive as a work communication tool. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? Do you prefer your work uh, not to have WhatsApp groups in work or your boss uh, contacting you? As a team, we made the call, that's the, we made the decision, that we don't use WhatsApp for work. It's an always on channel that can feel overwhelming, which means it too much at the best of times, just to keep on top of your group chats. Uh huh. Okay, let's break this down. It's an always on channel that can feel overwhelming at the best of times, just to keep on top of your group chats. Keep on top means to be in control, to be up to date. Overwhelming is too much. But what do you think? Is this a new frontier in cold sales? Like every new channel is probably pretty effective or is it unprofessional and invasive? No prizes for guessing my stance. Okay, so how do you guys feel about that? Do you think WhatsApp group messages should be kept away and just contact each other on Slack or via email? Or um, yeah, do you feel it's unprofessional and invasive? Definitely used a lot in business. Uh, that's would be interesting to have your opinions. It's very difficult to escape. I do think it needs to be um, there needs to be regulation. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go back to our uh, word of the day now, and our word of the day is synergy. This is something you hear a lot in business: synergy. Um, and we're going to look at what it is again. You don't. The definition here is synergy is the concept of two or more elements working together to create a combined effect that is greater than the sum of their individual effects. So working together to create a better effect than just separate. Here's an example. The partnership between the two companies resulted in significant synergy with each leveraging the other's strengths to create a new and innovative product that could neither that neither could have developed alone. Sounds a bit like, okay, I don't know what that means. Basically, it means coming together, working together, is, this is synergy, working together, two elements or more working together to create something better than they can on their own. So, a way to use this word or understand it is like there's great synergy between the two departments. There's great synergy between the Spanish and the British team. <clears throat> it's a very common word to hear now. So the synergy is great. The working together is great. Or there's no synergy. So it's a kind of business buzzword that you hear a lot. And essentially what it means is working together or how you get, do you get along well is there good synergy or there's no synergy i don't know so that's how i would say it it's seen a lot and i think for people it can be confusing it sounds like oh synergy yeah what's that you know working together getting along well together good synergy that's what you want in your own company between departments between the team between uh colleagues in different countries. We, I think uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a little bit of listening. And this is a topic that came up this morning randomly. And it's good to talk about random topics because here you develop your, you develop your English uh, in ways that becomes more natural. Okay, you're going to see something that you wouldn't normally, you'll see a lot in your own daily life but not uh not in english because you're thinking oh i need to only study this no we need to look at everything and let's have a look at this this is celebrating death in ghana in africa let's have a look accra ghana's capital It's home to Kani Kwe's carpentry workshop, which is, as usual, a hub of activity. This place is legendary, 
the oldest coffin shop specialising in fantasy coffins, dating back to the 1950s. Carney Quay died in 1992, but his relatives kept up the tradition. You guys are the original fantasy coffin makers. Can you tell us the story of how this got started? My father is Kane Kwe, and he was the famous who started this traditional conference in Ghana. And formerly, he was a, a, a carpenter who do furniture. And when there was a time a big man died in the family, he's a, a, a fisherman, yeah. So when the person died, they decided to bury him with something similar to the fishing. So they request a type of a coffin which is lobster. Word soon spread and families flocked to the workshop to request everything from fabric to fish. Any time the person died, the, the children will meet the family and tell the family that this is what our father told us. So we are going to see Mr. Kanekwe to construct the, the type. Of, so when they come, my father will collect the money, give them maybe one week or two weeks. Actually, we used to construct the whole thing by one week, but the finishing, you have to get time. So roughly any time we do a coffin, we actually give every time of two weeks to complete it. Carney Quay makes around 10 coffins a month. The choice of coffin is usually determined by the occupation of the person to be buried in it. So a fisherman might be buried in a fish, a taxi driver might be buried in a car, a lecturer might be buried in a fountain pen. As a journalist, maybe I'd be buried in a TV or a camera. Although, this doesn't look so bad either. As well as shipping coffins to Ghanaians living abroad, there's a growing demand from art lovers. CD's son Eric is currently carrying out an artist residency in Iowa and holding an exhibition of his coffins next month. And it's still very much a family business. Reginald is the newest generation. Oh, for me, if I pass away, maybe the hammer. I want the hammer, yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like this one, yeah. To bury it. Because I'm a carpenter and I love the work. Fantasy coffins explore everyday objects in imaginative ways. And this unique Ghanaian phenomenon is increasingly being seen not as a novelty, but as serious contemporary art. Now there are around 10 other fantasy coffin workshops in Accra alone, but Carney Quay's still the original, and it's staying in the family. Miranda Atti, TRT World, Accra, Ghana. Okay, there you go. Uh, I think that's very interesting, um, talking about death, but normally it's a taboo topic or a, a, a topic that we don't necessarily like to talk about so much. But uh, I think it's wonderful that they are um, celebrating death and it can be related to uh, your profession. Um, be interesting to know. I have a feeling this will take off or start in other countries as well. I think there would be a demand personally. A couple of words I want to talk about there is a hub. You'll hear this word now when you talk about business. You'll hear hub. It's like a center, a hub of activity, for example, center of activity. And also the other one is coffin. And that is the box that people are buried in. So um, definitely like to see that. It's a, a way of celebrating your career, your profession. And we're here on LinkedIn. We're talking about business. So what would your coffin be? 
you can leave me a message in the comments. What would you like your coffin to be when you die? Or sometimes we even, even saying dying, people don't like to say the word dying in English. It's when you pass on, when you pass away, or when you pass, often you'll hear, oh, my, my grandmother passed last week. It's, people don't like to say the factual word of die. It's, um, I suppose it is, uh, depends on how you see life, if you celebrate death and so on. So I think it's nice. I think it's nice indeed. And um, good to see. I think it will catch on. Catch on means like it will, or like I said, take off. So catch on in other countries. Other countries will take it. And I definitely see a future for this. Um, okay, we're going to move on now. And we are going to look at our idiom of the day. And our idiom of the day is cost an arm and a leg. A popular expression in English. And what does it mean? To cost an, alar- an arm and a leg means to be extremely expensive. So people in Accra there in Ghana might say, I really want to have one of these fantasy coffins, but they cost an arm and a leg. They're very, very expensive. Okay. They're not really affordable. Affordable means I have the money for it. So uh, these coffins cost an arm and a leg. This is our expression, very similar expressions around the world. And I really wanted to attend that conference, but the tickets cost an arm and a leg, so I had to pass. (laughs) It's interesting I'm saying pass for people when people die. Pass means um, I'll pass. No, thank you. Uh, There was an um, here in Spain recently, there was the mobile congress and apparently, I believe, the price of those tickets are extremely expensive. So they cost an arm and a leg. That is our idiom of the day, cost an arm and a leg. And now, finally, we are going to look at quickly, what are your salary expectations? This question that we get in interviews Nobody likes it. It's a bit uncomfortable. Well, let's look at ways that we can, steps to take before we answer. And that is research the industry and find out a specific job position to get an idea of what the salary range is. Salary is the year, your yearly money. Your wages are what you get at the end of the month. So you want to research the industry. You can use online resources such as Glassdoor, Payscale, LinkedIn salary, and you get an idea of the salary pay range. Number two here says focus on your skills and your experience instead of or rather than your current salary. Be prepared to discuss your skills and how they can add value to the company. Be flexible and open to negotiation instead of giving a specific number. You can provide a salary range from this point to that point, uh, let's say um, from 50 to 70, and that you would be comfortable that you would be comfortable with based on your research. And finally, be confident and assertive, be strong in your response. Don't be afraid to ask questions and clarify any concerns you may have. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at an example answer. And here's, well, I'll give you two, okay? So here's one. What are your salary expectations? Thank you for asking. Based on my research and my experience, I believe that a fair salary range for this position would be between $60,000 to $70,000 annually with room for negotiation based on specific responsibilities and benefits of the role. So leaving room for negotiation with room. So leaving this with room for negotiation based on the specific responsibilities and benefits of the role. Benefits could be working from home. Perks of the job, company car, specific days off. Anything that is a bit of an extra. Another way to answer would be. Let me move on down. Okay, what are your salary expectations? Thank you for asking. My salary expectations are flexible and specific uh, and dependent on the specific details of the role. I am open to discussing a fair and competitive salary range based on the job responsibilities, location and benefits offered. 
Uh, could you please provide more information about the compensation package for this position? So they should be talking to you about bonuses, working from home, expectations of travel, being in the office one day a week, two days a week, fully working from home. So my salary expectations are flexible and dependent on the specific details of the role. I am open to discussing a fair and competitive salary range based on the job responsibilities, location and benefits offered. Could you please uh, provide more information on the about the compensation package for the position? And that can also in include training as well. So I hope this helps. And I'm going to leave it there for today. If you're new and you've only seen me, I generally am on uh, once or twice a week and I'm helping you guys with your business English. I'm a business English coach and I hope it's helpful. Remember, giving me a thumbs up really helps. It helps your uh, network see me and uh, gets me a bit of visibility and I would really appreciate that. So that's me, James O'Reilly, in association with LA Cal Formacion. And I shall catch up with you guys and touch base with you guys next week. Okay, so have a very good uh, weekend and I'll see you guys very soon.